comrades, um, we are facing the most serious crisis of capitalism, at least since the 1930s. And it could develop into something even, um, even worse. A lot of the serious bourgeois analysts are commenting on this. Some figures indicate how deep the crisis is. In the first week of the lockdown in the United States, 3 million people, more than 3 million people registered uh, as unemployed. Uh, never seen such a surge in one week. By the end of the second week, it was 10 million. And the latest figures now are 17 million in uh, a very, very short period of time. Now they're predicting that unemployment in the United States could reach 30%. We're talking about more than 50 million people um, losing their jobs. Uh, even in the 1930s, it, I don't think it, it developed this fast. Obviously, the, 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 the crash was very deep. But the, the speed at which this has developed is, um, is unprecedented. And it's having uh, a huge impact on the, whole, on the whole planet, on the whole world, on consciousness, um, on the bourgeoisie itself, um, and it's having um, a huge impact on the in, on the economy, and it's dramatically changing people's lives. Um, now, in this situation, China, of course, played uh, a major role. First of all, because that's where the the, the virus started, but it, it could have started anywhere. Um, uh, virus, um, you know, they, they mutate and they evolve. It's in their nature to do so. This is not the first time in history that we've had such a phenomenon. Um, but it's not just, it's not the, the virus per se, the problem obviously, it's the way, it's the health of the system when this thing struck. Um, and as we've emphasized many times in the last few weeks, um, it was the trigger that pushed the system into a crisis which had already been prepared. Now we've given lead offs spoke at the World at the National Congress and we've had articles about this. This is the trigger for the crisis. It's not the cause per se. Uh, of course, they will try and push that idea because they will try and defend their system by saying that um, this is an exceptional circumstance and it's not to do, nothing to do with the market. But more and more commentators um, are coming out, such as, you know, we're all socialists now. Uh, all the talk about the role of the state the other night on the news uh, the commentator just, just just pointed out the banks um, were saved by a bailout and now they're refusing to um, um, to give the credit that's necessary even though they were saved by public money this is having an effect on consciousness as well but also a comment about how when when necessary they took over some of the banks uh, in some of them, they took a stake. Now they're openly talking about the state may have to nationalize whole companies and even t or take a big stake in some companies. You see how things have turned upside down. What was considered absolute taboo until yesterday is now the solution to the problem. The word nationalization is no longer a taboo word. Now, China had for years played the role of buffer in in really holding off the crisis it provided an outlet for exports when europe was in crisis in particular um, and now china has become the the center of uh, of the crisis both in terms of the impact of the virus although they seem to be gradually getting that under control um, but in terms of the economy the huge slowdown of the Chinese economy has had a massive impact on the global economy because obviously a major market has slowed down dramatically, uh, massive falling consumption, but also in terms of supply networks. A lot of the goods, a lot of the parts produced in China by multinational corporations and then moved around the world, um, they've had a, a problem at that level as well. Um, and and as, as I said, it, it's 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 spreading around the whole world economy. Um, now, the one of the big factors uh, coming into play here 
is one of the elements which had been produced by the previous period, which was a massive increase in debt everywhere. They had basically kept the system alive by massively pumping in you know, huge amounts of money into the economy. Uh, first with the bailout of the, of the banks, which massively boosted debt. And since then, they've not got it down, it's continued to grow. China was holding, um, uh, uh, had, a, had a huge amount of debt, but also the interlinked, interlinking of the economy. Um, back in 2013, China, for instance, had $1.28 trillion of, uh, of US um, debt. And it was the, the largest foreign holder of US debt. Um, the two economies were very closely interlinked, both financially and industrially. A uh, large number of American companies producing in China, exporting parts back to America, exporting goods back to America, and exporting around the world. Um, but China's economy was already slowing down, the rate of growth was slowing down, uh, its own debt was massively increasing. In 2000, overall debt, you know, all the different forms of debt, private, public, etc. In 2000, it was 120% of GDP. By 2015, it was close to 300%. So already before this crisis erupted, we have this phenomenon. And of course, we had overproduction everywhere. China had massive overcapacity. Europe, America, everywhere, there was huge um, overcapacity. Um, and it was just a crisis uh, preparing to erupt at some point somewhere. And it's usually the case that when all the factors have been accumulated for a crisis, some accident somewhere trips the system into, into a major crisis. And it appears to be that that's the cause. But of course, it isn't. It was the underlying uh, contradictions with it, which had accumulated. I have an article here from 2016 um, on the economy, uh, the Chinese economy, and it says, the title is significant, it says, what happens in Beijing won't stay in Beijing. That's quite prescient, not just from the point of view of the economy, obviously. Um, articles from the Financial Times from that period, uh, talking about a potential debt crisis of historic proportions. Um, and they were talking about the, the unsustainable growth and continued rapid accumulation of debt, leverage and credit. This was the Financial Times of um, 2016. So the serious bourgeois analysts had been looking at this for some time with extreme concern. Of course, the problem is, what could they do about it? Because to have acted on this debt in reality would have meant pulling back and pushing the economy into a crisis even earlier. From a classical bourgeois economist point of view, that is what they should have done. They should have allowed companies to go bust. They should have allowed uh, bankruptcies. They should have allowed destruction of productive forces in order to begin a process of recovery. The problem is that uh, the economy was so much on the edge that they realized that to push it in that direction would have triggered a major crisis. It wouldn't have been a managed crisis and slowly back to recovery. It would have been, in effect, what we're seeing now. And because of that, they were so terrified, they pulled back. Now, one of the elements which is terrifying them is the decades we've been through from the 1940s up till the recent period, they're obviously different periods. There was the post-war boom, there was the recession of the 70s, there were the booms of the 80s and the 90s. But overall, what we have is a massive um, increase in the size of the proletariat. I think this is an element which we really have to emphasize in understanding uh, the situation. China has created a massive working class and a militant working class. You look at the statistics for the strikes and protests up until a couple of years ago, and we highlighted this in articles that we published. Now it brings us, this brings us to a very important question. The proletarianization 
and the urbanization of the world population. More than 4 million people now live in urban areas globally. Um, it was only a few years ago that the urban population became the majority of the world population. 55% of the world population now lives in cities. Um, and by the way, about a third of those live in slums. So you can imagine over a billion people living in terrible conditions, which is an important element in what is going to happen with this coronavirus, by the way. They expect that within the next 30 years, two thirds of the world population will be living in cities. So the process continues. The world labor force, the latest figures I've seen, I was quoting 2.5 billion, but the latest figures I've seen indicate that the world workforce is now 2.9 billion. And just the metal workers alone are over 400 million. We have never seen such a huge proletariat in the whole history of, uh, of uh, capitalism. Marx said that capitalism creates its own grave diggers, and here we have billions of them ready to, to, to shovel. Um, now, the working class in the Marxist sense is wage labor, people who work for a wage. Now, look, look at what happened. The global supply of labor is the way that you refer to it. It, um, between 1980 and the early 2000s, the workforce doubled, and half of that today is um, is in asia in 1980 it was 1.2 billion in 2010 um, it had gone up to this figure of 2.9 billion this poses the question of the class balance of forces i.e the relationship between the classes between the bosses and the capitalists there's another element the world population in spite of countries like italy or japan which have a very uh, high uh, average age of the population um, the, in many countries, the overwhelming majority, the huge majority of the population is very young and it's a very young workforce and also a very educated uh, workforce, a knowledgeable uh, workforce. This is what capitalism has created and it poses a problem for the bourgeois, for the ruling class of how to govern society when you have such a powerful working class potentially powerful it, 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 not always conscious of its power but um it's 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 a huge force um the bourgeois are facing phenomena which is expressing the needs of this massive working class and just to, just to, just to mention two phenomena the sanders and the corbyn phenomena both of them in a distorted way had become points of reference for a huge layer of the population and for the radicalized layer in particular both of them acted as catalysts um the the, the all the ingredients you know sometimes in chemistry you have all the ingredients present but it requires a catalyst which doesn't actually partake of the final result but plays a key role in bringing all the elements uh, together and Sanders and Corbyn played that role of catalyst and brought to the surface um, the real underlying radical mood that existed, which we had detected for years. And we, we were saying, how, how is it going to express itself? Where is it going to express itself? Um, and in both cases, the ruling classes were extremely concerned at the Corbyn and the Sanders phenomenon. Now you see what they've done. They've put everything into it, into this, to remove those, to try and remove those catalysts, to try and remove those points of reference, which were providing really a channel for millions of people to move through and get organized, which inevitably means organized against the system. Now, um, look at Sanders. Of all the places where this could have been expressed within the Democratic Party, you know an openly imperialist bourgeois party of the u.s um, uh, ruling class um but hundreds of thousands in fact millions of people were galvanized around the sanders phenomenon um you notice the bourgeois organized every in every possible way to stop him from becoming the uh candidate 
because they understood that if he was the candidate, most likely he would have beaten Trump. Now, of course, they would have had the Democratic Party as a mechanism to hold him back, but it would have unleashed a massive force in the United States um, uh, with a hugely confident working class and a very powerful working class. They had to cut across that. And of course, here we see the reform is being put to the test. He pulls out, not only does he pull out, he calls on people to support Biden. Um, now, uh, many, many people will have been disappointed by that and many will be, will be feeling betrayed. There's a parallel here with Corbyn. Corbyn did not do what he should have done. He, uh, he will see now how ruthless the right wing are. They are not going to pull any punches. They are not going to behave like Corbyn, which is trying to appease the right, the, the left wing for fear of a split. No, no. They will push to kick out the, re the left. The, this is the, the brutal face of the British ruling class expressed through uh, Starmer. Um, but um, there is a greater radicalization uh, and, a, uh, and a layer has emerged which is not going to go back in the box. The people who came out in support of Corbyn, some of them will leave the Labour Party, some will uh, be disappointed. But the phenomenon uh, wasn't created by Corbyn. It was already there underlying and it, it surfaced because Corbyn gave it a point of reference. Sanders did the same thing. Um, now, what it means is that a wider uh, um, some will be disappointed, some may get demoralized, but others will be looking for answers. Just a little example I'll give you. Within 24 hours of Sanding, Sanders announcing that he was withdrawing from the race, our American comrades received 80, um, uh, 80 people wrote in to the comrades, 80 people interested in revolutionary Marxist ideas. Um, uh, the comrades have provided the quotes of people who are writing, says, I'm fed up. I'm fed up of these two parties. I'm fed up of this system, which, you know, we can't go on like this anymore. Um, this is the kind of development which is, which is taking place within the mass of radicalized people. There's an even more radicalized layer looking for revolutionary politics. Today, as we meet in Britain, our Italian comrades are holding um, their online uh, student Marxist study group. Um, they transformed it into a national meeting. They have something like 180 people signed up. They were getting four or five new signups every hour um, when I spoke to the comrades yesterday. This highlights the process that's taking place. There is a wider layer um, that is looking for answers, which they no longer find in the people they had illusions in up until yesterday or the day before. And this will continue um, as a process. And this makes, makes it urgent that we really take on board the radical change that's taking place um, and that we, we must break with all routine and conservatism and we must reach out to these layers in a bold way. Contact work must, be, must change. The way we work must change. And, and we're doing that. I, I mean, I, I can see it around around the the, the, the tendency in, in different countries. But um, going back to this question, the class balance of forces. You see, so long as capitalism provides a minimum standard of living, however bad it may be, but it you know you can feed your kids, you can clothe them, you can pay the rent. However poor you may feel, um, you 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 can survive and get on with your life. Um, and that guarantees a certain stability to the regime. But then situations like the ones we're facing now appear. Um, there have been scenes in Sicily where the police have had to um, stand outside supermarkets because people have attacked the supermarkets. I think we're going to see a lot of that. Rioting is going to break out in many countries. The extreme poor, desperate, um, I saw a video of a, uh, of a guy with his little kid next to him in Sicily saying um, the government has got to come up with money. We've got to feed our kids. We've got to feed this little one. He's got his child next to him. 
um, and people on media saying, are you ready to revolt? Once the uh, measures are lifted, everybody in the streets, are you ready? And they're doing it openly. Um, the response of the government was immediately to go on television with the prime minister and announce a 400 million euro package, basically handout to the poor to buy food. That's the situation we are facing. Um, that's nowhere near enough, but the bourgeois, are re they realize um, what a powder keg they're sitting on. Now we predicted, um, and I've mentioned this before, I'm not gonna go into the details, and I said it at the National Congress, Italy could spark a European-wide crisis. This is before the coronavirus. Um, and we've published articles on this and the Congress can go and read them. The bourgeois media have quoted, um, referring to um, the financial crisis in Italy, which is preparing, um, which is contagious. That was, that was the words they used. Um, now look at the situation we're finding ourselves in now. Italy is in an absolute desperate situation, financially, uh, economically, um, and it's hitting the population very, very hard. Um, and it's this is now uh, repeating itself in Spain, in Portugal, in France, and it's spreading across the whole of uh, of Europe. It's also, um, as I said, this this crisis, this 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 trigger which has brought to the surface all the underlying processes is magnifying them to the nth degree. The crisis of Europe, for instance, which starts with Italy. Um, the European Central Bank had requested that the European governments come up with a package of 1.5 trillion euros to save the countries who are facing a deep crisis, like Italy, like Spain, like Portugal. Um, there was a major conflict in Europe. Josh wrote articles about it. You can read the details there. But um, it, it's brought about a major crisis within the European Union. Um, the, uh, the European Central Bank was requesting this. The Italian government was putting huge pressure. Italy and Spain refused to sign the deal just, uh, just under two weeks ago. The European, uh, the European um, Union had to delay uh, the the deal as they try to patch up a compromise because there's a major conflict between what they call the north and the south of Europe the Dutch the Finns the Germans and others um, refuse they refuse to accept Italy's request to launch euro bonds which is basically a massive debt making machine which the Italians are requesting and the Dutch and the Germans and the Finns are basically saying we're not going to pay for your crisis. Um, now, the deal they've come up with is a package for 500 billion, i.e. one third of what the European Central Bank was suggesting was needed. Far less than is needed, and this is now creating immense tension in the political life of Italy. I was watching the Italian news this morning and last night, uh, unprecedented scenes taking place. Conte went on television last night openly attacking the right-wing parties. Not the done thing. We're supposed to have national unity, everybody's supposed to be together to fight this, uh, this crisis. He attacked them because they attacked him over the question of the European deal, because he didn't get what he'd been asking for. But Conte has been making a lot of noise, very belligerent noise towards Europe. I wouldn't have expected it from somebody like Conte. Conte is your, is your like insipid, individual who's been brought into politics to fill a vacuum and he was like considered a, a nobody that other people used but in this situation he's risen above and above that and um he has actually gained a certain popularity because he's seen as fighting this this uh, virus this crisis etc among some layers at least you know the democratic party and the five stars have actually increased their support and the right wing have gone down because the right wing are going down, they're coming out attacking to try and regain the ground uh, they've lost. He attacked, he went on and made one of his national speeches and he attacked the right wing. He used the opportunity to attack the right wing. This morning on the news, one of the leaders of one of the right wing parties, Meloni, ex-fascist, 
goes on TV accusing Conte of behaving like the North Korean regime, using state TV to make a political point. Um, and I don't have the right to speak, but to, to, to answer the points he's making. And it's, I've, I've not seen that level of tension, that kind of language between the different political um, uh, leaders um, in, um, in, uh, in Italy. But what it does is it reflects the deep tension that exists within society as a whole. Um, the, there's an explosive situation um, uh, beginning to appear. Um, there's a conflict, for instance, over the European stability mechanism which the Italian government refuses to call in because each government can request that it's be, it be used. But because it comes with stringent measures, um, they're refusing and they're, 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 the Italian government is refusing that and they're demanding a much bigger package. Now, um, it's bringing to a head the conflict and the crisis of the European Union. Um, before this, in Italy, mistrust of the European Union was at 47%, according to opinion polls. Now it's at 67%. If they had a referendum in Italy today, you might have a second Brexit. I don't know how you would call it, it exit or whatever. Um, but the mood is, has, has turned very sharply against the European Union because they've behaved in a way which is like Italy can sink we're not going to come to your help and that's forcing this prime minister who's not exactly an anti-eu uh, politician saying if this is the way europe behaves in a time of need what's the point of the european union this is the prime minister saying it's not the right wing um it shows you um how deep this crisis has become but it, as i said it reflects the 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 crisis within society as a whole um, that they're sitting on a powder keg in Italy. We've highlighted the strikes that took place in the in the in industry, in the metal industry in particular. Um, we were in a position in Italy where our comrades, our shop steward comrades, have led some of these spontaneous strikes. Pomigliano in Naples, the Fiat plant, or the Bonfiglioli in Bologna, or in Modena, or other uh, parts of Italy. Um, I was listening to one of our worker comrades in Bologna, a very down-to-earth proletarian comrade, um, works in a factory. It is in a factory not, not, not very unionized, not, not a strong tradition of struggle. He described what happened when this uh, outbreak of the virus uh, took place. He suggested a meeting, an assembly, uh, and the workers had the assembly outside the gates with the social distancing, that's how they do it. And um, workers were prepared, normally who would ne never go to such a meeting, went. He described one woman, female worker, young woman, the young two-year-old child. He said normally in the, in, the, in the hour lunch break, she'd rush home to uh, look after the child. When they had the assembly, she didn't go home, she stayed stayed and listened very very carefully to what was being said in that assembly and when the comrade spoke and he said it's time we manage things here it's time we workers took control of uh, of how things are run something which in the past would have been considered extreme something which would have been considered from another planet not now now uh, the workers were listening and as the comrade said they're not going to, you know, it's not yet the barricades, it's not the revolution, but prepared to listen to a radical alternative. Um, this is the mood that exists and few people feel that the system is failing them. And the bourgeois can see that. As I said, we're living through um, the worst crisis of capitalism since the 1930s and it could be worse. It's a very sudden, sharp change in the situation and as I said, the accumulation of all the contradictions of the previous period have now come out into the open because they had pushed the system to its limits in the previous period. That explains the rapid um, development of the crisis and how deep and how sharp it is. Everything was on edge just before this um, erupted. Um, and as I said, 
the uh, the important factor here is the working class which you see the working class you remember all those years that we spent arguing the working class does exist with facts and figures and yet the propaganda and even in the university it was the, all the talk was the working class doesn't exist i've even heard people who say factories don't exist factory manager yeah, that's old style stuff I often wonder, I wonder, wonder what these people, where these people think their clothes come from, where the food they eat comes from, where the telephones they use come from. The working class existed. The only thing was it was, wasn't as visible. And that was an important element in, the, the, say, the slowing down of the process of radicalization. You can't see who is going to change society. Now it's abundantly clear who can change society. In Italy, the news talks about the working class, the operai, that is the factory workers, um, and the role they're playing. That is an important element, not just for the working class, but for the youth. How many times have you talk to young people about the working class and they can't see it? I can remember that in the past. Now they can see it, and they can see it in a big way. And it's not just Italy, it's France, it's Spain. It's uh, the United States, the wildcat strikes. It's Canada. Here in Britain, we've had it. Um, now, suddenly, people realize, and all this talk about key workers, um, who now we see who really counts. Not the billionaires, not the people in the stock market, not the whiz kids in, in the city. No, it's the ambulance drivers. It's the bus drivers, of which the latest figure I saw, eight dead in London already. Um, it's the refuse collectors, people who are considered at the bottom of, uh, of society. Without them in this situation, we'd have the piles of rubbish piling up outside our houses. And it's the pre people who produce the food, um, people who deliver those, those workers who arrive at your door with the, with the vans delivering the goods. And it's the healthcare workers. And this, this uh, Thursday evening, eight o'clock, clapping the healthcare workers that's an important element that is basic working class solidarity for workers who are at the front line risking their lives for everybody else in italy yesterday the count was 109 doctors have died so far um nurse that committed suicide because she couldn't take the pressure anymore because of what she's having to live through nurses appearing on italian tv being interviewed telling you what it's like to have to care for people who can't see their relatives, who uh, they're gonna die because you haven't got the equipment, because you haven't, I mean, you, you listen to them and this has a dramatic effect on the consciousness of millions of people um, around, um, around the globe. Now, this, um, uh, the fact that the working class is emerging clearly as a force, um, in America, as, as I said, there's an excellent article by Tom Trottier of the 3rd of April that describes what's happening there. Um, but also, you know, in Spain and, and other countries. This is an important element for the future perspectives of uh, what is going to happen in the coming years. Because the working class has begun to feel its own strength, its own ability to organize. And this is an extremely important element um, in, in, in the equation. Now, they will, people will also remember that everywhere, all governments tended to play down the uh, virus and it's, it's, uh, uh, how contagious it was and how lethal um, it is. Um, because they're trying to play down the class antagonisms. Um, the, um, the, they're trying to um, push back this wave of class consciousness which is uh, which which has emerged and in this we have the classical role of the reformists bernie sanders precisely when he could just lift his he could just click his finger and he could create a party with millions if he wanted to but of course that would then accelerate the process of revolution in the united states corbyn could have fought um, more seriously but pulled back. The trade union leaders, you see that in Italy, they, call, they called a strike in the Lombardy region in the metal, chemical 
and textile industries. It wasn't a, a full general strike, but in three key industrial sectors, 90% participation in that strike. They were threatening a national general strike. What did they do? They pulled back, signed a deal, and a rotten deal at that. The trade union leaders are holding back the potential for class struggle. Here we see graphically the role of the reformist leaders and the trade union leaders faced with this historical crisis of the system. They pull out all the stops, sorry, to defuse the, 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 the movement and try and reduce the class, um, the class antagonisms. Um, but um, they can't put, I'd say they can't put it back in the box. This is going to stay for the coming period and the experience will um, add to the experience of the working class as a whole. They won't forget how the different politicians behaved in this crisis. They won't forget that it was the workers who were being asked to risk their lives. Um, and workers are reasonable people. Ambulance workers are not requesting that they be sent home. The nurses are not doing that either. The workers in the food industry are not doing that. But workers are saying, if contagion comes from close proximity, then um, why are we being forced to produce goods which are non-essential? And there's been a struggle over that. And also without gloves, without masks, etc. This has led to class struggle in, in, in many, uh, many countries. And you see the appeal of our Italian comrades, which has had a certain impact. And in Italy, many workers and shop stewards signing up to it. So it resonates with workers because they feel this, this problem as a burning problem. Um, now, um, sorry. Um, see, we see the governments in this situation, as I said, Initially, all of them delayed taking the measures. The reason why the death rate now in Britain is so high, it's getting higher than Italy, is because they delayed for so long the measures which could have slowed it down, the measures which could um, slow the spread of the virus. We had this incredible scene of uh, Boris talking about losing our loved ones and uh, herd immunity. He very quickly shifted from that. I think somebody high up must have realized you're going to provoke an almighty backlash of the British working class if you go down that road. And so they did a, 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 a massive U-turn um, and started apl applying the policies that everybody else is, is doing. Um, but what's interesting is the reaction of the bourgeois to the economic crisis which is now unfolding. The collapse in the economy is so deep that it's terrifying the bourgeois. And that explains why they're throwing billions, trillions actually, at, um, at the economy and uh, taking measures. Now they're all, they're all begging um, at the doorstep of the state. The state, which was supposed to be pushed out of the economy, has no role to play in the market economy. Etc. Etc. Et um, now uh, the state is being asked to save the situation for them, both in terms of huge amounts of, ca of money being thrown at the companies themselves to keep them afloat, and in terms of social buffers to provide people with a minimum income to get through um, this crisis, because they realise that without that, you would be talking about social revolution in the very short term. Um, that explains why they're doing that uh, and they're hoping that this won't be so long and that they can get um, they can get through it um, everywhere there's also talk of national unity um, even in Britain I, heard, I saw comments that Boris won't be able to survive unless he turns to the Labour Party and hey presto the Labour Party now has a leader that is prepared to do that um, in Italy you had this so-called technical committee between the government and the opposition in comrades in different countries, in Brazil, they're talking about national unity. They're talking about getting rid of Bolsonaro. For example, the slogan, Fora Bolsonaro. Our comrades in Brazil were the only comrades who raised that slogan at the beginning. 
even the lefts were saying, oh no, he was democratically elected. Now everybody, everyone, why? Because the masses on the streets are shouting for, uh, well, not so much on the streets maybe, but uh, through other media, they're shouting uh, for uh, Bolsonaro, down with Bolsonaro. But they've, they've gone the other way, down with Bolsonaro, but support his health minister, who's calling for uh, more stringent lockdown measures. And they're appealing for national unity, Lula and all the others, they're calling for national unity and national effort. It's very similar to a war situation where you have the creation of a national government, where all the main parties come together um, in the national effort and the, an attempt to play down the class differences when in reality it was the working class soldiers who were dying um, in the war um, mainly and here it's mainly frontline workers who are at risk working class people who are at risk so they're trying to ferment this spirit of um, national unity but what's amazing is how quickly the class differentiation emerged in spite of all of this you see the strikes you see the protests you see the class solidarity. Now, the world economy um, is facing a major crisis, as I said. Um, in um, uh, in uh, China, in the first uh, first quarter, um, the the calculations were that there could be up to a forty percent fall in in GDP. Not 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 an annual rate, but a short term quarterly rate which we, would be the biggest fall for 50, um, for 50 years. Um, there's another element involved here too, apart from the big bailouts, um, is the use of the military, the use of means of surveillance, drones, uh, mobile phone tracking, all, all these measures, which they have. Um, now, initially people are supporting the use of these measures because they want to reduce social contact as much as possible. But there's also an element of getting people used to the idea of these measures because they realize that once this crisis is over, maybe not immediately, once the crisis is over, there will be a sense of relief on, a lot, on the part of a lot of people, a desire to get back to living a normal life. But uh, what's gonna come after this crisis? Massive public debt on a scale we have never seen before, which at the moment they are pumping up and pumping up. They're going through the roof of all the, the limits they've imposed in the past. The European Union has had to change its tune uh, uh, and end its policy of imposing austerity in the short term, although it's left its mark. You know, in Italy, the mood with, with, on this question is when we needed help, the Germans were demanding stringent uh, uh, fiscal policies. When we were at, um, um, uh, um, in our hour of greatest need, we were abandoned, not just in terms of economic policy, but cases of things like delivery of masks stopped in some countries, held back and not delivered to Italy. Um, a, a mood of resentment um, building up um, on this, this question and then very quickly, the Germans, the Dutch, well, the Dutch seem to be particularly obtuse on this, but the Germans and others forced to loosen the uh, purse strings a little bit because their own economies were being impacted. I saw figures, Italy and China are the two major, the two biggest export markets for Germany. Um, so Germany has been hit very hard by this, uh, this, this situation. They're now loosening up and releasing billions and billions and trillions globally, not just in Europe, somebody will be presented with the bill for that at a certain point. And that will be the same people as usual. It'll be the, um, the working class. Once this is over, they will give us all the statistics um, and they will say, this debt is unsustainable it must be paid back and they will do it by attacking the working class like never before. It's going to be very difficult however. Can you imagine bourgeois politicians arguing for the privatization of the health service after this crisis is over? That's going to go down really well with ordinary working class people or cutting back on staff, cutting back on funding because that is what they want to do. 
They want to privatize. They want to introduce the market into the healthcare system. That's going to be one major battle that will erupt once this crisis is over. Um, because the consciousness of the masses will be the opposite. We want a better and more integrated national healthcare service. We want more nurses. We want more doctors. We want more spending on research, etc., etc. Um, and they won't accept this idea that the market has to play a role in this. Um, and the same applies to other sectors like transport uh, and so on. The consciousness towards a, a more collective running of the economy is actually growing. Exact, precisely when the bourgeois need to push it in the opposite direction. Now, the coronavirus, as I said, is accelerating all the processes that were already in place. Um, there's an economic impasse which had been prepared. This has just accelerated it and brought it to the surface. The conflicts between the powers. Look at Trump, for example, attacking the World Health Organization, accusing it of being China-centric um, and uh, uh, threatening to withdraw funding. Precisely when you need actually need a greater a world coordinated effort to combat this virus, Trump threatens to undermine um, the World Health Organization. I'm not saying the World Health Organization is, um, is the best thing since sliced bread, but you need greater coordination. And precisely at that moment, he um, pushes in the opposite direction. The crisis of the EU is being highlighted more. Even the divisions within the ruling class. In America, you have a, a sharp division over how to face this crisis. You have, you have Trump, uh, who has done everything possible to accelerate the spread of the, of the virus. And in fact, America is becoming the worst infected and the center of this crisis now. And we haven't seen anything yet. It's speeding up to the nth degree. The scenes of the mass burials in, uh, in New York or the news of people who refused care because they don't have insurance. In America, it's going to accelerate the process of the discussion about what kind of healthcare system we want. Um, and it will push the question, we need universal um, public health care. And it's accelerating uh, the process of radicalization of the working class and the youth everywhere, something which had already begun. Um, now, um, uh, just a few figures. Germany, second quarter, minus 10% GDP. France, second quarter, minus 6%. Everywhere, it's down. The world uh, economy, they calculate 6.2% fall. The Eurozone, minus 12.2%. Um, and the serious analysts are saying this is going to continue and into uh, 2021. We're talking about possibly an, an, you know, a 12 to 18 month um, crisis because of this um, uh, coronavirus um, um, uh, pandemic. Um, companies are facing bankruptcy. Uh, the bourgeois are terrified, but the people also are frightened. Workers are frightened of what's gonna happen. Um, this is, this is um, uh, radicalizing uh, the situation um, further. Um, it's a situation where slogans uh, that in the past would have seemed extreme can connect. Nationalization of failed companies is not um, seen as an extreme slogan. Open the books, for example, when a company says we can't pay wages um, is another one. Um, the classic uh, transitional demands come to the fore in this, in this situation and connect with ordinary people. Um, another element in this crisis is they are literally printing money. Uh, the banks are releasing huge amounts of money as a short-term solution to the lack of liquidity so that people can, can buy goods and try and keep the market going. This is something they did after 1929 and they said they would never do again. They'd learned their lesson. But you see, there's not much they can do in terms of tools to uh, solve this um, crisis. This means that they are preparing um, inflation, inflationary pressures, which at a certain point will erupt as, as, as inflation globally. Imagine a situation where you have austerity on the one hand, lack of jobs on the other, and massive inflation. My reading of history is whenever you've had a sudden surge in inflation, 
you also have a surge in class struggle. After the Second World War in Italy, for example, the, there was hyperinflation and there was a massive wave of strikes, strike after strike after strike, because the workers are forced to strike, because the money just isn't enough to meet the rising prices. So bad was the situation that the bourgeois actually conceded to the working class the sliding scale of wages. It was better to give that than to face a constant mobilization of the workers in strike action. Um, this is um, this is the situation that we will be um, we will be uh, facing. So all the the all the elements which they tried to avoid in the past by pumping the economy with the credit and uh, and boosting debt um, will emerge in a much um, bigger um, wave. And once the 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 actual pandemic is um, sorted, um, there's going to be a massive backlash on all fronts. And the world is going to be a very different place. The European Union will be uh, in pieces, not necessarily broken up completely, but all the cracks will be there and the, and, and the, the, the breakdown of that uh, union is being prepared. Brexit was just the beginning. World relations will be sharper uh, between the United States and China, between the United States and Europe. Um, and um, uh, the, the world will be in, in much um, deeper uh, turmoil, not to mention the, the situation in places like um, Pakistan. I had a railway worker contact me on Messenger yesterday. I've been in touch with him a few times, uh, a trade union leader. He, he said uh, how bad the situation is there. And we were talking about, you're supposed to wash your hands regularly. How do you wash your hands when there is no water? when there is no soap. In Brazil, I was talking to the comrades, in some of the poor areas of Brazil, families say we have one bar of soap a month for the whole family. In Pakistan, clean water is difficult to come across. How do you social, how do you do social isolation when you live in slums? When I quoted that figure that one third of that urban population is in slums, that's like one and a half billion people living packed together um use a separate bathroom you know you don't have a bathroom you, you have maybe one toilet for a whole number of houses i've been to parts of lagos where the shower is not a room in your house it's a shack at the end of the slum where everybody goes and uses that water um to uh, to wash in india we see the barbarism where they announce the lockdown and immediately millions 100 million workers start to march literally walking hundreds and hundreds of kilometers to um, their villages uh, all crowded together there's going to be a massive spread of the virus you're going to see people dying on the streets dying in hovels dying in slums um, no system to care for them. Millions of people who could have survived will, will not survive um, because of the system that we live in. The poor usually are invisible, or at least they're, they're, they're kept in the background. Um, now, this virus is bringing to the surface the real situation. The homeless who are dying in New York and being buried in these anonymous graves um, I was talking to a Nigerian comrade, talk, spreading, explaining the situation there. The reason, one of the reasons why the virus didn't spread so quickly to places like Central Africa is because not many people travel to and from Central Africa. It's not like Italy or Britain or China, where there's a lot of moving about, of, you know, company directors and people. It's, uh, there's very little, but the point is this. Once it gets in, and starts to spread, then it will be an absolute nightmare. But, but look, in Nigeria, they're doing 500 tests a day. The population is 200 billion people. But let's not forget, in malaria, malaria kills in Nigeria, tens of thousands every year. According to World Health Organization, 110,000 deaths a year due to malaria. 
um, mostly children. We have phenomena such as Lassa fever um, and um, that kill 5,000 across West Africa every year. There's the irony of the situation. Nigeria has a very young population. The average age is 54. Why? Because of the conditions, people do not live to a ripe old age, like in um, Italy, which has an average age of 83. And some are saying that's a positive thing because young people tend to resist. So extreme poverty is seen as, 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 a, as an advantage. But they, they, have, they have four doctors per 10,000 inhabitants, five hospital beds for 10,000 people. This is the kind of scenario um, we have in these countries. It's going to be an absolute nightmare in these countries and it's going to bring to the fore the real brutal nature of this capitalist system that we live in and this is going to radicalize further the youth of the world the workers of the world um, and it's a tragic and it's a dramatic situation people are suffering people are losing family members in terrible conditions People are living under extreme stress. This, this lockdown is causing immense stress to millions of people. This energy that's piling up is going to be released at some point. And the, the period we will enter after this crisis is over is one of intensified class struggle, one of, of an extreme financial crisis the system uh, will be facing, and a bourgeoisie facing a world where they've never had such a big working class and once it starts to move the bourgeoisie will find it extremely difficult to govern the situation this will produce sharp turns in the political scenario you will see for not sharp shifts on the political front um, what radical ideas of the past will become what is considered normal for today um, what was difficult to argue before becomes very easy to argue today. Conservative elements will become revolutionary elements um, in, um, in society. And this is a period which the Marxists have prepared for for decades. All the hard work that we've put in, in producing websites, papers, articles, discussion groups, discussion circles, leaflets, posters, etc., to spread the ideas when it was difficult to win people to these ideas. That is now an investment that we will uh, use in the next period. The evidence everywhere is that we are, we are contacting a much wider layer of workers and youth who are asking questions, who want answers, the Marxists are the only ones who can really explain why this crisis is so deep and how far it, it has gone and also explain the solution. It needs a worldwide coordinated effort. It needs planning. It needs the methods of what is we would say a workers state, i.e. a society run by and controlled by the workers. The workers in Italy, when they try to impose themselves on the bosses in, on how to reorganize production to make it safer, showed that not only the bosses and other people, but they showed themselves that they have the ability to manage and run industry. That is all piling up as experience. And we are moving into a completely new period and we have to really step up to build the Marxist alternative, the Marxist tendency, which can connect with wider layers and become the point of reference for, for the radicalized workers and youth in the coming period, which can then at a certain point start to become a mass force. Once that happens with this size of working class, no one will be able to stop the workers from changing this world and creating a completely new society which is possible and which we can touch we can feel with the solidarity which is being expressed with the self-organization which is happening with the help groups which are which are being set up uh, and, and and all the radical 
debate which is taking place. Our time has come, comrades, and this is the best period to be a Marxist. And as I said at the National Congress, also to be young and to be a Marxist is, is an amazing thing to have. Uh, we have to work hard and build the tendency which can give the working class the ideas with which the working class will then transform the world. That's what this is about.